Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the uh, CIS webinar number uh, four. Uh, the, the theme today is the impact of the crisis to the African sport. Uh, and I'm very pleased uh, uh, to have uh, some of our former students uh, and former uh, graduates uh, present. Well, I would like to remember you before that if the CIS uh, channel and uh, just to, 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 to put on the bell and uh, to get some notices about uh, how, the, how, the, how the webinar is going. So let me first of all today introduce our panel uh, and I will do in uh, the other side starting with the, the uh, not with the first uh, uh, um, alphabetic but for the end of the alphabetic. So Tuba Sibanda to start with, is uh, one of the graduate of the FIFA Master uh, on the 2018 edition. Hi, Tuba. And Tuba has a particularity. She is from uh, Zimbabwe and she works in Namibia, two African countries. And uh, she knows about working with the Federation, with projects, and she's currently dealing with a, with a development program. And uh, she will tell you a bit more about, about, about what is going on. How are you, Tuba, and how is the situation at the moment? Uh, in um, I'm very good, thanks, Prof, and thanks for having me, and hi to all our audience, I guess. Um, um, the situation in Vinduk is like everybody else, we on lockdown. It's been a month plus counting, I've lost count, actually. Uh, but um, in general, it is going as decently as we expected to. Namibia still has very minimum number of cases and we are hoping to keep it that way and we are trying to keep as engaged as we can possibly do so under this time and this situation. Thanks so much. So uh, next is uh, Mohamed Al Shawarbi from uh, from uh, Egypt uh, who did the in uh, who did the course uh, of the if I'm of, of the CIS and University of Cairo. He did another master's degree in, uh, uh, with the, the Olympic, uh, Olympic master in, in Greece uh, and is now uh, working in, uh, for, for a private company in sports uh, after working for many years uh, for the for, for, for the TAF. Uh, and he's uh, like Tuba, he's an African from Egypt but working uh, in another country, in Morocco. Uh, so, Mohamed, uh, how are you? Hello. Hi, Pierre. Hi, Tuba. Hey, Mohamed. Hi. <laughs> so, indeed, current, but uh, currently I work, I'm based in Morocco. However, uh, due to the current circumstances, I'm stuck in, uh, in Cairo. Uh, I was on a mission uh, in Ghana, but then uh, I had a transit in Cairo and then Borders got closed, flights got cancelled, so for the time being, I'm at home with family. Good. Working from distance, like everyone else. Good. Good. And, and how is the situation in Egypt at the moment? In Egypt, things, things are okay. We have, uh, it's, it's the month of Ramadan, and we have, uh, we have curfew, we have times to, uh, specific hours to go uh, to work and, buy, and get some, some uh, like food for, uh, like to, get, to go to the shops. However, like during the, during the day, we can go, we can we can move normally. It's not a total lockdown. However, as of 9 p.m. till 6 a.m., we are uh, we have to be uh, like locked down. It's it's good. We have to stay at home. Perfect. And our our third guest is Samson Adamo, FIFA Master Graduate from the 2009 edition, uh, who is from Nigeria. And as the, the two other panelists today, is an African from one country working in another one. He is from Nigeria, but he's head of competition at uh, CAF, and he's at the moment in Egypt as well. Uh, Samson, uh, hello. Uh, how is the situation in, uh, in, in Nigeria? What do, do, do the, do the family say? Hello, Pierre. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, like you said, I'm, uh, I'm like Mohammed. I'm in, I'm in Egypt stuck in egypt so maybe i know more about the situation in egypt than in nigeria unfortunately <laughs> yeah so in nigeria i'm just reading on the news like every other person but yeah i guess it's um it's pretty stable and i mean luckily the situation in africa in general is not as 
bad as it was in Europe and some countries in Europe. And I, I don't think there's a panic for it in Africa. So really, the situation is more or less the same uh, in most countries in Africa, Nigeria and Egypt. And um, like Egypt, we have a curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. So you're not supposed to go out at night. And it's the same thing actually in Nigeria as well. Okay. And the cases have been stable. So I, I thought about today uh, focusing mainly on the impact this crisis has, uh, have had, and may have, not, not looking too much on the long distance future in, in the in the next uh, moments about uh, the developing football of african football it's interesting because in our panel we have somebody as we just said from uh, the official part from the uh, african confederation somebody who worked from the private industry investing in sports in africa and somebody working with ngos and with the state uh, a, a unit so i think these elements are what represents really the African sports, and it's it's absolutely essential that we look at uh, the various aspects. To start with, uh, what is the current work all three of you do have at the moment? Samson, can you tell us in a few words, uh, being, being in charge of competition at CAF, uh, we know that the competition uh, have stopped in Africa as well. Uh, what what what's the work and how, how does it work at CAF at the moment? So, from um, in terms of the administration for CAF, like uh, we've been working from home for a bit over a month now, I would say, and um, actually it was announced just today that it's going to be extended until after the month of Ramadan, and that is also because. We still don't know when football activities will resume. So currently we're working from home, but um, we're, we are still very well connected. Like we still have conference calls and uh, still in touch with the administration for the work that we need to do. But uh, in terms of uh, dealing with the federations and the football rescheduling the competitions that we have, as you know, um, the year after the World Cup, uh, after the after Cup, it's usually qualifiers for all the different competitions that we have. So currently, before the um, everywhere was shut down, before the lockdown, we had qualifiers for the under-17, under-20 Women's World Cup for next year. We were supposed to organize CHAN, which is the second or third biggest competition that we had in Cameroon in April. And obviously, all that yet uh, got... Um, postponed of the situation. So currently we're evaluating it with the health authorities and we're having meetings also with the with the stakeholders like with Cameroon and trying to find out how we can reschedule the competitions that we have and how we can deal with it catching up. But uh, the good thing to be honest is that we have had some previous experience in terms of dealing with this kind of uh, crisis. Not, of course, not the coronavirus, but we've had Ebola in the past. I remember in that. In Africa, <laughs> we, exactly, we've had Ebola that we dealt with, and we also had different situations where we had to change calendars and had to work with very tight schedules. So in that, I mean, later on, I can go in details in terms of how we're managing that. But uh, generally speaking, um, we're just monitoring the situation to be able to catch up with all our competitions. And the good thing also is that we're having constant uh, conference calls. Like tomorrow also, we have a conference call with FIFA uh, in terms of uh, to talk about the women's football, the qualifiers, and also the calendar up until 2022. We're still discussing the calendar and how we can uh, move the event. So two of the FIFA competitions we're playing qualifiers for have been postponed, so it means we have more time in terms of uh, catching up with the qualifiers. So we're dealing with it as we can, and we're pushing everything forward. Great. Uh, Mohammed, you, you know about, about competitions that had to be made last minute. I remember your time uh, <laughs> in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, but tell me, tell me a bit, uh, for your company, uh, how does at the moment uh, the work uh, well, proceed?
We have ongoing projects. So from various clients, we managed to get the approval of the authorities to proceed with the work, of course, while respecting some like, uh, like the, the measures, safety comes first, of course, the safety and health. So luckily we got those uh, approvals to continue some work. So this is the first aspect. Uh, the second aspect, were, like it's good also to see uh, that the world is kind of slowing down. So and pausing for for the time being, so it's everything is almost on pause. So this helps us to study and reevaluate the whole situation. So uh, for the pending uh, dossiers or projects with the clients, everything is being prepared. Uh, for example, if uh, if we have some offers or consultations to prepare, so. We're studying everything from distance, and as soon as we can fly again, we will fly directly to the clients to discuss with them, meet with them, and to meet uh, their requirements and uh, to see their needs. And lastly, which is the la lastly, which is the most important uh, inf or like topic, of course, we are observing the, the, decis the decisions mainly with the, uh, with the African competitions. Uh, what's happening next um, with, with regards to postponement or any other decisions. So uh, from my side, I'm checking and observing to see based on the next competitions and the next dates, this will be the start line for us to go to go next. So uh, this is where we will we go next. Message for you, uh, Mohammed. There is, uh, there, uh, uh, there is Frank from Cameroon that remembers that you work together. Uh, for the organizer, he was one of the training working for you at the time you were at, at CAF. And my question on that is, did the, the experience you had uh, with organizing events on the last minute help you in the present situation? Indeed, indeed. Um, like everything that I've learned today and the rest, most of us, we learn from challenges and difficult times. This is, uh, this is the most important thing that i've learned through all the years that i've uh, i've learned in uh, that i've learned from working in the african continent uh, as samson just said uh, we experienced ebola um, if we go back to november 2014 where there was the draw of the africa cup of nations in equatorial guinea and uh, the opening game was mid january and um, from the infrastructure point of view everything was organized organ infrastructure point of view and organization everything was done in two months mm -hmm. and uh, we, we we have like one picture we might also share with you in, in the few seconds so in Equatorial Guinea you will see for example the most important thing in in, in our in, in our competition is the football field so you will see from the pictures in December 2014 you you will see the pictures that actually you like I will let this picture. The, the picture will speak out itself. So the first picture on top, uh, it's in December 2014. However, mm -hmm. if you if you look on on the picture at the bottom, it's it's on the 8th of Jan 2015. While the opening the opening of the tournament was mid Jan, and uh, I'll I, I'll let also uh, Samson also to add a few points about that. But just to explain that with current circumstances such as Ebola. And, uh, and the short timings where we had to organize such competition, these challenges, they allowed us to, to be prepared for what we are living and experiencing today. Uh, we, we work on various scenarios. We see how we can do things to, to improve. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, don't I would agree, make, I would make I would make a small, uh, I would make a small uh, uh, bemol on that, uh, the, the question of transportation. He'll, maybe, and you already started with that, but we will discuss in a few minutes. I think mm -hmm. there's a huge distinction with, with where there is a major question mark is a question of transportation. That for Africa may be a, a key issue in the, in, in, in the next future. Uh, Tuba, tell us a bit, um, how do you work, particularly for the, for the development program you're doing and, and, and as well the, for the academy? Um, thanks, Prof. Uh, I'm actually very excited because I I can feel the the blood starting to rush a bit when the the, the gents are talking because um, 
you couldn't have put me in a perfect panel to talk to the guy who's in charge of competitions at calf level and uh, you know someone from the private sector because i kind of um bridge um, the gap between both entities so working with an ngo in an ngo environment um of course it's right at the most um grassroots and foundational phase of, of football in this instance as you can ever imagine so i feel that there is over time has always been a sort of disconnect between the two um the grassroots level and the elite level and being able to bridge that gap and more so um obviously as a head coach of a university women's football team also bringing that context of uh, of the uh, not professional um uh, female player because it's not professional in africa at all but being able to represent the interest of that uh, of that player as well and as a female in a continent that is uh, very um diverse but also doesn't really um accommodate or present those massive platforms for for women at a, at a certain level so i think that uh, in general how i'm working at this time is um functioning the best that i can uh running community projects uh, somehow supporting the young people that we work with um because the we work with young people from highly um low income communities where even if you say lockdown lockdown to them means no food and lockdown to them means a high pressure environment where potentially they are um in an environment where they are stuck so forth with their abusers and stuff like that so we're trying to uh, obviously the work that i do uses sport as a tool to reach those young people and sort of help them cope as an outlet but also as a way for them to find themselves and this is more than ever an important time to be able to reach them so we are running community projects providing food toiletries and somehow supporting them and in a continent like africa where not everybody is able to connect um, in terms of the internet uh, where internet is a luxury so what we're doing right now is a luxury that can only be um, accessed by a very few small percentage of africans um, let alone the kids that I work with, for example. So we can't talk about virtual games and running stuff like that because the kids don't have devices, neither do they afford the, the data or the internet uh, to be able to connect. So we're trying to reach them somehow and we're doing our best to run um, uh, programs, uh, uh, handouts, printing, and really delivering those stuff to them directly. Uh, from a safe distance, obviously, we have to do everything at a distance, but we this is the nature of the the challenge that we we're facing and the work that we're trying to do okay perfect uh well you know i would like to go to the problems if we if you allow me one of the problem we see currently is uh, uh the problem with with financing uh, uh we had a, a webinar two weeks ago uh with with uh, start startups in sport and, and one of the key problems they are experiencing it's a risk uh, with financing with uh, with the sponsors that may leave uh, the world of sport and uh, let's say in the periphery because uh, from the from the finances unfortunately point of view african sport is seen as a periphery do you have the impression that there is that you are, i mean what i'm talking is not to 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 see on the long distance but currently what do you how do you manage to keep your your partners how do you manage to keep your 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 stakeholders involved with the field of sports and uh, does it work and uh, how, how how do you how do you continue to develop these projects who wants to start mohammed i can start okay samson yeah, i can start and pass it to the expert uh, mohammed who is working in the private field i mean for calf is um uh, for calf i think for most uh, sporting organizations like um, confederations is not as difficult as it is for the private sector and Mohammed can talk about the private sector uh, later on because we have um, the agreements are signed uh, their long-term agreements like so you know the current agreement with CAF is an agreement that was signed for 12 years and so whatever negotiation needs it to be done was done before and now it's in terms of just evaluating the situation after when we know when football activities will resume to normal so we know which competitions if possible to be cancelled and what will be the financial implication with those um, tournaments are not going to be held 
and whatnot. It's too soon to be able to say what the financial impact will be actually because we still don't know when football activities will be yeah. resuming back to normal. So, but generally speaking, I think that the ones that are um, the ones that are hit are like confederations, I would say, because even currently, as it is with CAF, even I mean, thank God for it. Is, uh, since most organizations are cutting our salaries and not paying, I mean, we're still conducting interviews and we're still hiring at CAF, so the situation is not as bad. Good. Or rather, yeah, be before passing the, the word to, to Mohamed Al Chawarbi, uh, we had a message from uh, one of the alumni of the FIFA Masters 17th edition. Lili Borisova from Bulgaria, and she was uh, she was asking uh, because she she's she's currently uh, meant to be working in in Egypt because uh, uh, they they will create uh, the basketball African league in Egypt, and she was supposed to work on that. So she was really interested to know uh, uh, if you have some 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 ideas on when if it can if if there are some calendary. Uh, when it could resume, and uh, have you heard anything regarding that? Uh, before uh, giving it to Mohammed, uh, I still my Arabic skills is not up there yet, so I'm only following the news secondary when people send it to me. So Mohammed is following closely. Luckily, he's in Egypt, so he's able to answer better. But I think that, uh, like I said earlier, the situation here is not. Uh, one of panic people are not panicking people are kind of respecting what they need to respect and life is still going on as normal and there's no spike in terms of the numbers since people are still egypt is a country that has uh, over 20 million people that are living in and uh, the number of uh, cases we have is still not crazy even though people are still going about their normal activities so i think that the country would open up uh, very soon and most likely after Ramadan, which is what CAF also has decided. So after Ramadan, I think activities will start going back to normal. And the government seems to have things under control. And while it maybe you have a better response than this. Yes, indeed. Indeed. So actually, um, like as Samson said, we're not in, in, in panic or, or a total, we're, like we're not in a total lockdown. So currently, if we go to the streets now, like I'm allowed to drive, I'm allowed to go, uh, go to the shops. Even some people go to work to, to work to the offices. So we are working. Some of us are working from home. Some of us are working from their offices, which is which means that the work is going. So we're not we're not stopping. Everything is going according to the plan. However, we're respecting the measures uh, by the country by the WHO to ensure that we have. Uh, maximum uh, health, uh, like maximum health security and precautions, of course. And uh, for the organization, organization of the competitions, indeed, like uh, as soon as we have the decision of the of the border, the borders opened again, they, like we will be able to travel, we will be able to to host uh, the competitions. Like uh, as Pierre just said, as you just uh, as you said, Pierre. So the thing is, the the challenge is transportation, for now. However, like if you like, we, when we check the news in most of the countries, now everyone's working within his country, but it's now it's about the transportation and the borders are kind of closed. But still, all four, of us, all four of us are living in a country that is not the one we are. We are citizens <laughs> of, so Indeed. we know what we're talking about. Indeed. <laughs> so yeah, but but just just to confirm, like, and to confirm and assure everyone else, we are working. Uh, all the plans we are like are on the right way. We are working, and um, like things are on the right track. Maybe things might be a bit might take a bit longer or shorter or, or shorter than expected. This depends on the situation, which we cannot control. It's bigger than us. It's bigger than football and bigger than sports, of course. But we are ready. We are ready. We are working. We're doing the best our, uh, the best we can. And now, to, just to move to the to the question for the stakeholders. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very important, uh, the relationship with our stakeholders. Uh, everyone is being uh, understanding, so there's complete uh, and total understanding by our various stakeholders. And uh, to look at the bright side, now it gives us more time. Let's say we have a competition that was supposed to be organized this month. Now it gives us more time, uh, as if we can, you can say that the, like, our deadline got a bit of, uh, of an extension. 
uh, due to the postponement of the of some matches or competitions. So this gives us more work to more time to to make sure that our work is done and completed on time. Mm. Yeah, uh, and 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 the situation for 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 you uh, too uh, with NGOs. Uh, Sponsors and and partners are a key a key element. Uh, any 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 new trends you experienced in the last two months? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, there is a bit of support trickling in for you know obviously COVID nineteen related responses um, um, and and stuff. So it has the fact that um, my organization is active has sort of allowed that we were able to. Um, put ourselves in line for that type of funding that is specific and tailored to the pandemic. Uh, but obviously, from a football perspective, with um, with the girls team that I work with, uh, and everything is on hold. And because our women's football league was supposed to kick off in March, um, it's also obviously on hold. And coming from somebody like me that's working mainly on the ground, um, it it's a bit of a different worry, uh, if I may put it that way, because the financial implications post the, the lockdown is is what is a concern because usually football is sponsored by corporates and 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 those same corporates are currently closed so they're not making any money so what it means for for women's football is a different worry because uh, we have a corporate sponsor that's funding the league not just funding like it's not they're not like they're funding the players to pay the players but they're just funding that the league is able to run so without the ability for the league to run um, and with that sponsor's inability to to facilitate that it you know it can fund uh, the women's football program it it presents a different sort of challenge for us so i think our worry is bigger because we are on the ground and we uh we feel like we will get the pinch of most of it because also women's football in general has been csr um in in most companies so what it means is that the csr component might be cut post the lockdown and i know that um, africa hasn't felt the pinch in the sense of the active cases or infections currently in the continent but i feel like the pinch will be post the lockdown when the financial implications are trickled in because the corporates are a heavy um a component for us for us to survive um in in the sporting field so yeah, I, I would like to continue on that on that issue because uh, uh, the students of the FIFA Master told me last week that uh, one of the leaders of the of the uh, uh, financial fair play at, at UEFA gave them a lecture. He was saying, you know, one of the possible problems emerging from the crisis is the fact that many clubs may stop investing in their women's section. Many national sporting federations may be less intended to uh, spend money on, on, on women's football. Uh, women's sport may be more at risk than, uh, than, is it, than male's game. Is it, is it one reality you are experiencing at the moment in, 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 uh, in Namibia? I mean, for me, I'll say definitely, because if you look at the nature of the women's football teams, and Prof says that, you know, many men's teams might not invest in women's football, but it's not, that's not entirely the, the picture on the ground. It's not like Manchester United as a ladies team, for example. The picture on the ground in women's football is that it's privately started uh, football teams. The teams that are most successful are probably the teams that are funded by the armed forces. So like police or, or, or military and stuff like that. So those teams might have a way to continue because they're institutional teams. My university team might have a way to continue because they're university team. But there is tons of teams born out of communities that are fully funded by individuals, by women that have come together and chose to play soccer. And so for sure, the challenge is not even entirely that the men's team um, investing in the women's team, but the challenge is those individuals are currently out of work and not earning anything so they cannot sustain and the the female football players are currently not being paid for playing football so they and they're currently not at work in their bread to butter work that gives them the funds to enable them to buy the soccer boots to play football so for us it's a it's a different reality on the ground because it's not about when football resumes will we have our players back but it's when football resumes will our corporate sponsor um rally behind the league to ensure that we have enough competitions 
to keep these girls that are invested in the sport that they love playing that sport that they love. So it's sort of a different um, reality. Yeah. Samson, I'm sure that 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 uh, uh, that calf will will focus on that issue in the future, definitely. Yes, I mean, for us, a cap is slightly different because, I mean, with most uh, companies, you would, once you, you're struggling a bit financially or your finance get hit, you would tend to focus only on what uh, brings you revenue and what doesn't bring you revenue. It's, uh, you would have a different approach to it. But for CAF, it's slightly different because, like, you know, Confederation is to develop football and women's football, to be honest, now for us, it's a top priority. It's, it's top priority, meaning that it's close to the senior national team uh, competition. This is actually one of the competitions we were supposed to organize this year, year in November, and it's one that we had uh, many discussions on because um, if you think about it, uh, organizing national team competitions now it's a lot more complicated than sure. club competitions because if you have to take uh, and now even we've increased the number of teams from 8 to 12. So imagine taking uh, 12 teams, each delegation is about 30 people, taking them to a country still this year it's a bit challenging and most countries would not be open to that but it's so it's easy for us to say that we are actually going to postpone this competition to next year and not to do it but we still have hopes that the situation in africa will get better and we would uh, take a decision and we're still hopeful that we should be able to organize this competition that women uh african because women um competition is it's really a priority for us now. like you know even not just saying that because the women's football department got created last year in calf and then we have more staff now there's actually currently two alumni that are working in that department i'm sure some people know them safia and meski they're working in that department and it's a big focus. So the approach for CAF is slightly different, but I can understand how women's football would be one of the areas where yeah. uh, we'll be here first. I will go on that further because we have a course in three African countries at the moment. In, in Egypt with the University of Cairo, in Senegal with the, the Sheikh Anta Diop University in Dakar, and in, in, in Port Elizabeth with the Nelson Mandela University. And we see in the recent years that the number of students who like to work and who are working in women's football is increasing largely and uh, there is a demand that is there and uh, i think it's good to hear that from the side of the of the CAF there is a demand as well to have uh, more women mm -hmm. present in the as much commissioner i know and more women involved in the in the in the in the in the running of the game am i, am I right on that we, 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 we have the same national commissioners and just a few months ago it was the number of teams increased from eight to 12 teams mm -hmm. it means that we're expanding the women's football yeah and and uh, uh, uh mohammed do you have more women uh working in the sports industry as well from the private sector or is it a male only uh, sector still no indeed on the um... On the administration and the uh, bureau d'études, on the on the technical uh, department, we have uh, indeed we have uh, we have like nearly forty percent, if I can say. Mm -hmm. And uh, however, in the on sites, on the sites and the construction, mostly yeah, mostly men for the for the construction itself. Uh, and, the and manpower, on, yeah. Top. Well, the come again. On the top of the of the organizations. Are indeed, women? indeed, indeed. Yeah, everything. Everyone is equal. So yeah, it's, uh, we have the hierarchy is uh, is horizontal. It's, it's so indeed. So we have like 40 percent of women. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, and what I what I wanted to to go uh, further to is about, do you know what can we learn from this crisis from a continent all free? What you said is a difference. One of the reasons why the the crisis is a bit less is. We can't cope with uh, dealing with 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 crisis. We can't cope in 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 uh, finding solution on the short term. Uh, well, how is the place of sports to change after that? 
currently in the organization of Africa? Is it thinking at the moment, not, not seeing on situation we don't know yet, but at the moment, do you have the impression that having a sport back to track is one of the important elements to a return to normality in, in, in the places you are? And do you have the impression as well that the organizations you're working for will use this crisis to be better positioned uh, and modernize their, their background, uh, to be better positioned for the future, to be com more competitive or more, well, more from a point of view of governance, probably at the at the uh, at the CAF, probably from the term of competitivity with other uh, with other partners. Uh, what are the changes you are thinking uh, will be first coming? Let's start with Tuba. Um, thanks, Prof. I mean, that's a um, interesting question. I, I feel um, in general that what this pandemic is teaching us is to evaluate and reimagine a way of, a new way of doing things as well. I think that as a continent, we've obviously um, had the core work of our war work has been focused on physically gathering, sport in the stadiums and and our uh, economic stream um, coming through sport has been mainly sponsorships and a bit of broadcasting for those countries that are really um, have competitive and interesting leagues and, and stuff like that. And I think now what it presents for us is to, these are the questions we should actually be asking ourselves. You know, we should be looking at our competition format. We should be looking at our competition calendar. Is it giving us sufficient um, justice and quality um, to expose not just the players, but to expose coaches, referees um, in, in, in platforms like that? Are there, is there enough platforms for them to grow? Is it promoting um, uh, a, a way of being able to raise awareness, pass a message? You know, the humanitarian context of sport, is sport really doing its work in bringing people together, building communities, even economically empowering nations and stuff like that? And I think this is the level of conversation that we should be be working how can sport raise its own money how can we invest more in the infrastructure to be able to give back into you know into into sport in such a way that without even without the funding stream coming in we can still be able to say that we are able to raise sufficient funds to survive so how can we make our team sustainable enough for the long term and how can we make sport you know purely holistic develop it holistically from youth women men um, and be able to get sufficient development of players at all levels, no matter the gender or the age and stuff like that. And I think this is the right time to have those type of conversations because we can't physically gather, but we can put heads together and on paper find a new way to do things. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but but as Rafael Chilingita just asked, you know, as a, from the financial point of view, if you compare. Uh, Europe with Africa, UEFA just gave recently uh, 500,000, uh, uh, 500,000, uh, sorry, 4.3 million euro to, uh, to, to the nation, to the nation uh, federation on top of what FIFA gave. Uh, is CAF uh, willing to help as well? Uh, the Well, it's, sorry, it's Alidu Salifu who said, well, on top of the 500, thousand from FIFA, they will add some 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 money to each of the federation. Will it happen the same in Africa? Um, like, you know, African problem, we try to find African solutions to the problem and really not just to copy what is being done in Europe, even though uh, I mean, it's nice to help the federations. But uh, currently what we're doing, I know that is a lot of conversation is being had and we have meetings in terms of finding ways that we can help our federations to deal with uh, the situation better. We actually just sent also a circular to the federations to ask them how they're dealing with the domestic football, what is the impact in the domestic football, and we're checking what is the, the best way to, to for CAF to assist. It might not be, I, I mean, I don't know, it might not be to give financial assistance directly. It might be in other ways to help them in terms of dealing with um, this situation. Um, from, but of course we're we're, we're having meetings and we're having conversation in terms of how we are going to 
help to deal with this situation, to help the federations, to help the clubs also to deal with it uh, better, because it's not only just the federation, there are also the clubs participating in our club competition. And we also have evaluated uh, the teams that are participating, that are supposed to participate in competitions that may not be had. Maybe uh, there will be prize money that will be distributed equally among all the teams that qualified if they're not played. I mean, these are uh, different ideas that have been discussed, but nothing has been um, decided yet. But to be honest, the general principle is finding uh, problems, finding solutions to problems that is unique to us rather than just um, dealing with it, how the world football is dealing with it. Good. And, and uh, sorry, Mohammed, I give you the, yeah. word, the floor in one second, but uh, it may be what you just said as well, uh, connected to what has happened in the last year when the final of the uh, ca of the CAF uh, uh, teams, teams competition, mm -hmm. the final uh, I mean, uh, didn't, uh, was, was a sort of a problem and, and some, mm -hmm. some, some issue may be rediscussed. Uh, are, you, are, you, are you using the crisis as well to rethink, rethink some of the key issues that the, the football in Africa were, was uh, experiencing in the last uh, year before, basically in 2019 and the start of 2019? Yeah, yeah, it's good that you mentioned this, uh, this incident that happened because the CAF Champions League final, you know, that the match couldn't be completed because of passions for, I mean, it's a good thing and a bad thing because of the passions from the spectators. It's a similar thing that happened actually in Copa Libertadores that they actually had to go to Madrid to organize the final and... <laughs> In a way, it's uh, competition is growing. It's good because I mean, there's so much at stake. The fans are a bit animated, and it was actually a bit of an issue that happened. A technical issue. Wouldn't go into it, but the part of the immediate measures that we took is from then on decided that the club competitions we played in a neutral venue and be played rather than playing it uh, traditionally in two legs in the countries of the teams that are participating so of course we take measures and we're learning from it so now this is the current situation and as it is still looking forward to it the final of the champions league we're at the stage of the semi-finals that's why it stops so we don't know who's going to be in the finals but they are all not african teams in the champions league and the final is de was decided to be played in cameroon in one of the new stadiums that would host the uh, afcon and that will host also the chan and so that is exciting for us to see, like for the very first time in the history of the competition, we played in a neutral venue and not in the country. So this would definitely avoid, help us avoid this kind of scenarios that you said. And it's the same way, like you mentioned earlier, that we'll learn from the situation, like uh, with the pandemic, with, uh, with the coronavirus, we'll also learn from it and see new ways that we'll deal with it. And as you, uh, also asked earlier in terms, I think someone asked about the finance and how the finance is affected by it. Um, it's, uh, I think health is very important. People have seen how important health is in terms of dealing with daily life. And as everyone has been in the lockdown, they also have realized the importance of sports and how football <laughs> is what football means to people because uh, <laughs> Even for uh, even for my for myself, to be honest, I I miss it so much that I was watching uh, players playing PlayStation football on PlayStation. That's what it's come down to now. We watch PlayStation matches, but uh, it shows how important it is and how much. To be honest, that the corporate bodies will still invest in football. They'll still invest in football. I don't think that with the pandemic that they will not invest in football. They see that uh, football is. It's not a matter of life and death, but it's close to it because even as health is there, people are still uh, wanting to invest in football. So I think it wouldn't suffer so much after it, but the way that it's been consumed and the way that it's been approached will be more severe in terms of insurance will be more important. The health of the players is going to be a priority for it and uh, in different ways we would uh, witness how it is. I think Wimbledon was the ones that actually got it right a bit. They, they pay for this kind of situation insurance every year. They've been paying for 10 years and they got some uh, good money from insurance out of it because 
of the situation that happened. I think they paid probably maybe about 20 million uh, pounds and they got hundreds of uh, millions of pounds from it, from the insurance. So most people, most sport organizations will learn from it and see how it's approached differently. Great. Sorry, I took a uh, bit too much time. No problem, uh, Mohammed. Yeah, indeed. So in addition to the insurance uh, that Samson mentioned, there is also, like, just to keep it simple, in, in life, there is always force majeure. So force majeure, a case of force majeure, there are, there are many things that we will not be able to control. However, what this teaches us is to plan everything ahead as much as possible and to be proactive. And whenever there is this kind of, this kind of issue, what we need to do is work on the various scenarios and see how, how, we, can, how we can find the best possible solution. Uh, and we will not be able to do so if we don't work everything uh, ahead. Um, in addition to this also, uh, I'm sure most of us are aware that FIFA also developed uh, like COVID regulations to, to help and to find solutions for the transfers, for the players' transfers. And there is also a panel uh, by, uh, composed of experts just to study and discuss each and every problem, uh, uh, most of the problems that are affecting the, the federations. And based on this, there will be some sort of assistance or help based on the problem in each in each country. Yeah, and one, one, one well, uh, I think uh, I will, I will, I will conclude soon, and I will ask you, you soon, any, any, any words of conclusion because uh, we need, we need to, to imagine what are the, the next elements, what we should do to, to, to resolve uh, some of the issues from, a, from an African perspective. What I see. Uh, as one of the necessities is, is to imagine another kind of professional because that's very very uh, very, very important uh, uh, to, to to develop elements. but we just received various questions so I would like to to start to start with with Flory's uh, question Flory did our course in, in South Africa uh, uh, but uh, she would like to know uh, uh, how the graduate from uh, all the all the courses uh, we did, so you can see, they can they can help in working with the members of the association, particularly in this moment of the crisis. How can the CIS graduate, the FIFA master graduate, help in improving the situation at at federation at federation and, and members association? Where are the the trends where they could really uh, put their, their prioritize their their, their involvement? Any, any ideas on where to prioritize? Uh, the, well, I would say, I mean, since we deal with uh, member associations, the most, the priorities for now, since it, it's it's like, uh, as Mohamed said earlier, it's a case of force majeure. So force majeure situations, the solutions are also novel solutions that we deal with. And the first thing is actually understanding very well what the problem is before even knowing what's, because each federation, their problems will be different. Like uh, since we're in touch with the federations, for example, Botswana, they told us that until October, until the end of October, there is no gathering that is going to happen in the country, no footballing activities or whatsoever. So regardless of what happens before, they would be on a lockdown. So understanding what their problem is, understanding what they have scheduled, and the financially how they're losing money and what they're going to do is to help them to deal with uh, it in that way because we cannot really say um, what solution would be there's no general solution to it each country is going to be each country's situation is going to be completely different so it's understanding very well what the problem is first and then there are opportunities there that you find for sure yeah uh, well, uh, and, and, and I know that, that, that CAF is doing a very interesting element from this point of view. Is you are recruiting young staff, you are changing your, 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 your background in staff and looking very much and, and having younger staff in, in, in the organization. That's uh, colleagues told me in the past. Exactly. I mean, even in, the, in terms of the alumni that we had when I joined was one but now we're about five alumni that working and we're, we're yeah. very in touch 
talk with the people. Like I also had the privilege of speaking with the current African students and we had a good exchange in terms of what uh, the plan is and going forward and the strategy. I mean, speaking about the CIA's network and the FIFA masters, the strategy is that we, we help each other. We help each other to, in terms of where there are opportunities and where to be fixed. And I've connected them to speak with some of the uh, my colleagues in CAF and also even in the Federation to speak to them and just to connect the network through. That's where you can find good opportunities when you speak with people that are working in the different fields because we have people working in the Federation. And what we're doing even in, in CAF now is we have uh, different seminars which we organize from like the general coordinators workshop. We have also protocol workshops that we organize and as much as possible we try to connect with uh, the CIA's network because it's a network that's I mean the organization is of trust uh, I mean I could speak I think we're very fortunate I can speak uh, on this on behalf of the president because I know he mentioned it many times like it's he believes very well in terms of the educational system of going through education I'm a product of it because I'm an alumni and we have the FIFA master alumni, at least about five, like I said, working in council, he believes in this uh, whole network and believes in getting education for it. So we try as much as possible to have the people that we trust because they have gone through their professionals and in industry. It's not a matter of their professionals, and then we get them to do different various things for us, even at the national level, at also at the CAF level. This is the first place that also that we look at when we're uh, recruiting. Uh, people and we try as much as possible to actually even advise the federations when they need to fill in positions. We we push them uh, to people that are professionals in industry, people that studied actually the in the field that we are, and so so we continue to do that. Great, and and I think what what we have to do is to continue to recruit good students with absolutely. Uh, strong academic and ethical basis that's that's, that's mm. what is what makes a difference i think uh well you see <laughs> you see ali do is just thank you for doing that. Uh, well tuba and and mohammed any any last words you would like to conclude any points you would like to to, to share with with our uh viewers yeah i would start with the with the network which is cis yeah, doing it's it's a very interesting thing and you like from the last uh, from the last workup in Russia, like uh, we were all there, and we got the chance to meet with the whole network in various countries and various continents. And uh, and today, like I'm in touch with this network thanks to to those events. Like uh, I'm in touch with with the colleagues in Senegal, which we we never took the course together or the or the diploma together. However, we're on the same network, and whenever. We need, we need any sort of collaborations or support or any need of information. This whole network, this is where we work whether, with regards to vacancies, information on, about projects, uh, whether private, uh, even the private sector. So any sort of assistance or information needed or even work purposes. So this is the network. So this is the family. So, and that's one of the reasons why we're all here today, thanks to, thanks to, to the network and, uh, and the family. So with one with one click of a button, we are all connected. We are ex talking and, and exchanging and finding solutions. And lastly, just thanks to challenges, we will come better. We'll grow stronger to overcome whatever obstacles we, we will be facing. And still, all of us together. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm I thank you so for that. Um, thank you, Tuba. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, just to reinforce what Samson and Mohammed have said that we. Uh, we have a vast network of, of FIFA master alumni and the CIS network, and we are able to, there is so much competence within the continent um, to be able to raise this, vocalize these issues and have this type of dialogue that allows for information exchange, benchmarking, but also tailored to the African context. And I think that's what we need to start investing more time in, more time in platforms like this, where we're able to come up with those um, type of solutions and really present a, a truly Africanized solution for, for some of the programs that, problems that we face because they are truly rele um, um, more relevant to our own context um, more than it is to the rest of the world type of con context. So I think that we have unique um, 
things that we deal with and we can best address them by really coming heads together and being able to have this type of engagement and just to reinforce that platforms like that and networks like that are very, very important um, starting platform to lay the foundation to be able to then practically uh, be able to make a difference in the in the sporting environment in Africa. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, I will, uh, we will, we will uh, close the discussion. I would, I would just uh, uh, like to remember our our, our viewers uh, that next week we will have um, uh, the fifth of uh, our webinars, and the title will be Sports Development Projects, Current Status and Perspectives. And we will have three speakers on, on that uh, on, on, on next week as, as this one. Uh, and we are very, very, very pleased to, to continue. And uh, uh, have a nice week and take care. Bye.